Okay, okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to say welcome. Welcome to the first podcast episode that I am creating in my own home. That's right. I built this whole studio in my house. It's been the labor of my work. And you know what? I'm pretty satisfied, to be honest. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I, I am... I am quite satisfied with this, to be honest. If you're tuning in today, I, I appreciate it first and foremost, and I have to say thank you. Thank you so much for checking this out. More likely than not, you're someone who's in my circle of friends. You follow me on Instagram. You follow me on Facebook. Uh, I sent you the podcast through a WhatsApp group. I have been overall terrible at marketing. Now, in this episode, I'm going to talk about why I'm terrible at marketing, but I think the overall theme of this episode is going to be the story of tenacity. Now, I know that may seem very broad, but I'm going to really whittle it down to this moment right now with COVID, to what's going on in the world, and I'm going to relate it back to stories in my life. And I hope that through listening this episode, you're going to get some sense of a little bit of who I am, what I do, why I do it, where I do it, and when I do it. The who, what, when, where, why. We call it the five W's or the journalistic pyramid. (laughs) Professor hat coming on. Come on. School is in session. You didn't come here for that. Let's be honest. Okay. You came here. You stumbled upon it. Probably the people who are going to listen to it are my parents because they're worried about what I'm going to say. And and the first, th- and this is not the first, first episode I've recorded, okay? This is not the first episode that I've recorded. This is, this is in fact, episode number three of episode number one. And I'm going to tell you why, right? So in this episode, what you're going to hear from me is you're going to hear a little bit about why I started a podcast, what took me so long to start the podcast, and overall the story of my life. So buckle up. Here we go. Let's get this party started. So the reason why I labeled this podcast Tenacity is because, honestly, it took a lot of tenacity to get me here. And I really want to talk to the people out there who are listening to this who may be struggling with things in their lives that they feel like they're never going to overcome. Now, that's probably 99% of the world. Maybe 100. But that 1% never really gives in to the truth about the struggles and difficulty it takes to kind of push through things and have tenacity. But I guess to start, my tenacity... And I I would define tenacity as your ability to take time and work your ass off to get what you want. Time-acity. Tenacity. Time and working your ass off to get what you want. Okay? I know. Joke wasn't that good. We're going to get better through this episode. I promise you this is going to be the best podcast that you ever listen to. So the reason why I really wanted to label this podcast tenacity was because it took a lot of effort and energy to get me to this place today to doing a podcast because I am jaded when it comes to media. And I'm going to get there by the end of the story. But basically, I have many different selves, okay? Now, I'm going to talk on a little bit of a weird communication point, but I have many different selves, and one of me is a stand-up comedian. So when you listen to this podcast, you're going to get a lot of things where I'm trying to tell jokes, I'm talking about humor, um, I may be interviewing certain people, right? 
The other part of the podcast is going to be about not education, but being an educator. And there's many different ways to be an educator. But I also have a different self that is a college professor. And that part of me is no longer or currently in effect. I'm no longer a college professor. But you're going to hear a lot throughout this podcast about what it was like to be a college professor. And a lot of the things that I talk about are going to be in terms of definitions and communication terms and theories. School's in session. And so there's two different selves. There's the comedian Aaron the Speaker and there's college professor Aaron the Speaker. And today, this is the story of tenacity and how I got to both. So to begin with, I was, I always had trouble and maybe you did too growing up, but my parents divorced when I was a very young age, okay? I was nine years old, and I remember I went away to a summer camp because we had a very, very fortunate friend who gave us a very severe discount. I'm talking about pennies to go to a summer camp. Now, this summer camp wasn't the Ritz-Carlton people. This, when we got there, they were still mowing the lawn. The grass was above our heads. There was leaks in the roof. I had to use a poncho over my bed to stop the rainwater when it rained hard from dripping on us. We had to find beds and take springs from other beds and attach them to our beds because we'd sink through them. The mattresses were like Ritz crackers that were soggy. This wasn't no luxurious camp, but I loved it. And while I was away at the summer camp for three months, my parents had been fighting for a few years. We had moved to a few different cities. We finally had landed in, in a small Coral Springs area on the border of uh, Coconut Creek, which is another area in, in South Florida. And when we were coming home from camp, we were driving to the airport, and I was crying. I had never wanted to go on a plane. I had never been on a plane before. I didn't want to fly, but we were, but we were coming home from camp. And my dad turns to me. I'm in the front seat, or I'm in the back seat. My sister's in the front seat. And he goes, kids, I just want you to know when you come back home, you're going to be living in different houses. What? You're going to be living in different houses. Me and your mom ended up getting a divorce. We live in separate houses now. My sister starts crying. I start laughing. I'm, not, I'm like 9 or 10. I have no idea what's going on. I'm, just, I'm laughing because she's crying. You know, I'm, It's brother's sister thing. She's the older sister. I love to see her hurt and cry and be in pain as a child. So that contradiction of, you know, growing up in a, in a household with divorced parents was not easy for a child. And so I had to have tenacity really early uh, growing up because I had parents that are two very different. And I, I'm sure many of you have parents that are like this. And not everyone has parents that are, you know, synchronized in their personalities. I had one parent that's extremely strict you know, very much into discipline and routine. And another parent who is not so strict, more into, you know, letting you do what you want to do as long as you're happy and safe. So one parent is strict. One parent is what we call in communication theory, laissez-faire leadership or, or leadership that kind of lets you do what you need to do to figure it out to become the person you need to be. So growing up, I had to have tenacity because I was stuck between two worlds, Right. Now, thankfully, I was born a giant. My, my father is, you know, 6'10". Six, six my mom is six foot, I, And I was born 6'9". No, I'm just kidding. I was born, but I grew up to be 6'6". Six six. And so they just threw me into sports. And sports taught me a lot about tenacity. You know, never give up, hard work, always try hard. And so those sports philosophies were really seeped into me as a child, but I, I always wanted to be an entertainer, right? I always wanted to make people laugh. I found myself idolizing my, my heroes like Robin Williams. Uh, I idolized uh, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy. Um, I idolized uh, Jim Carrey a lot. And so I found myself always in this performance state for my class, you know, for my, for my fellow classmates, I would, you know, 
I would put things in dirt on the ground. I'd say, well, I bet you I'll eat this. You know, I would, you know, um, be challenged to do certain things to get me in trouble in class. And, and, and by getting in trouble and having to deal with a parent who was very upset when we got in trouble, it, it the tenacity came from always having to find a way out. And I think that tenacity comes from that, right? Always trying to find a way out. Because you have to have things not be easy to be able to work hard to get through them. And so if you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure there are things in your life that are unfair, that are, you know, difficult to understand why they're happening to you, that are, you know, difficulty to understand why can't it be this way. And tenacity is that thing that says, you know what, I don't care I've been dealt a a shitty hand. I I don't care that, you know, life is unfair. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to try to do what I got to do to get what I need to get done. And that's what I've done, right? So let's fast forward. I barely make it through high school because I didn't care about school. I was diagnosed with... uh, Attention, hyperactive attention deficit disorder at a very young age. Um, Not like one of those things where you just go to a doctor and they give you Ritalin. I had scans of my brain done. They saw hyperactiveness in certain parts of my brain, chemical imbalances. Um, I had difficulties with reading and writing comprehension, meaning that like I couldn't read sentences and comprehend what I read. I had to reread it over and over and over. Um, I would read words out of place, uh, because my reading was terrible. My writing was just as bad. And so I struggled in school. I remember there was a time where I was in eighth grade. I had taken this test called the FCAT and the FCAT was this test that was meant to measure you to see if you could pass and move on to the next grade. And I remembered all middle school, I'd gotten into fights. I was constantly in detention Um, I was constantly, you know, being threatened to be suspended from the school. I hung out with the bad crowd. They were far more interesting than the good crowd. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in was not a wealthy neighborhood at the time. Um, it was a lower end income neighborhood. And so, you know, school to me and my peers was not a priority. Sports was, basketball was, soccer was, baseball was, um, And so I found myself in a very crappy situation because it didn't seem like I was going to be able to pass this test to move on to high school. And I remember taking the exam and they came to my dad and they were like, I know your son's in eighth grade, but he reads at a fifth grade level. Now his math, his math is above a middle school level, but he's reading below a fifth, he's about a fifth grade level. Okay. Your son's dumb when it comes to reading, but he's, he seems to be intelligent, but I use the word dumb sparingly to say he doesn't seem to care or try and, and his disabilities don't help. He doesn't want to acknowledge them. I was a rebellious kid. I was angry. I, I was wearing Jinko jeans. Remember Jinko jeans? My jeans were so big. I could have cloned myself, taken the fabric and we both could have had clothes. So I remember what my dad did, you know, he did what any father who grew up in New York City, raised by parents who were Eastern European Jews, and his father raised him with tough love, right? He told me all these stories growing up about his father would, you know, he would come home late, his dad broke a broomstick over his back, you know, just the classic I love you stories from, you know, tough Bronx raised families, right? So my dad did what any loving Bronx father did. He beat the he beat me. He beat the crap out of me until I would read. And you know what? Looking back, I don't blame him. I would have beat me too. Because I was not the easiest kid to deal with. And he was dealing with a lot with a divorce and and having a wife that was very different. Three kids. They're all crazy. I'm getting in trouble. I'm getting suspended. I'm getting kicked out of schools. You know, 
and he beat me from a fifth grade reading level and he forced me to read and would not stop. He had tenacity to keep trying on an on a individual, a young child who was just making it difficult. And I remember he beat me all the way to an eighth grade reading level. <laughs> and even though I couldn't sit on the seat because my ass was sore to take the exam, he had beat me enough to at least have me pass the bare minimum reading levels and move on to high school. So to even get out the gate, middle school, eighth grade, it didn't seem like I was going to be the one to make it in education. So I get to high school, immediately, you know, the sports teams are like, we got to have him. This kid, six foot three, six foot two, you know, I was great at sports. I was known around my community for playing sports because I was so athletic. I was just naturally athletic. No discipline. Just a natural athlete, right? It's just pure luck. Of course, I'm playing baseball, you know, at a high level in ninth grade and 10th grade. I'm on travel baseball teams, travel soccer teams. Sports is just my thing. And because I played sports, I got a lot of leniency in the academic realm. And not only that, I got a lot of leniency because I was also in ESE, which is considered special education, right? Kids who have autism or mental disabilities, um, emotional spectrum disorders. I was that guy. I was in that. I was in those classes. And it, and it frustrated me as a kid because I looked normal. I felt normal. But my brain wasn't normal, right? So it was a very difficult dichotomy for me to have to say, I know I, I know I feel I don't feel like I have special needs, but why am I in this class with special needs? But you know what? Thank God my father had tenacity to keep me in those programs because they gave me extra time on tests. They protected me when I got in trouble. I was protected under the American Disabilities Act. I got a lot. I got a lot of protection. That was like my shield. And I ended up using that later in life to my advantage. But as a kid, it, it, it frustrated me. But thankfully, my father was just, my dad is just a ball of tenacity. Like, he shits the word tenacity. Like, when he shits and you look in the toilet, it's like, tena- I couldn't spell it, but I could tell you that it, sh- it said tenacity. At least it had the T. He shit a T. So, I'm in high school. I barely make it past, you know, ninth and 10th grade. I start, I, st- I, I hurt my elbow playing baseball because I'm an ass, you know, I try to throw, I I break my wrist in practice one day, sliding into home plate, the catcher, you know, I hit his, his cleat, you know, sliding into home plate, bent my thumb back, fractured hairline fracture in my thumb, I'm wearing a cast, and I try to throw a baseball with the cast on, you know, and it it hurts the ligaments in my arm, and I have to rest my ligaments, and I was a pitcher, I was tall, I was like a Randy Johnson, but a righty, tall pitcher, throwing heat, heat and I have to then change my whole sports directory and that summer I go to play basketball in 10th grade and because I was around six foot four at this time I was athletic I could jump I could dunk right um but I didn't know the game of basketball wasn't really a basketball didn't really play organized basketball growing up as a kid I was a baseball soccer swim I ended up playing, and I ended up making the varsity team, right? So I make the varsity team, and again, a lot of protections come with playing sports and having bad academic grades, right? I didn't really have that. I didn't know what tenacity was back then. I didn't really have it. And so like a lot of kids, I, I squandered opportunity, a lot of opportunity. And it comes to my senior year of high school, and I'm failing classes, right? I'm into the semester. At this point, I don't live with my father anymore. We had too many domestic altercations. You know, I'd be, I thought I was growing up to be a man. You know, I'm, I'm a big kid. Um, I'm living with my mom now. My mom's more laissez-faire. You know, I'm failing a bunch of classes and they call us, they call my mom and dad in. They say, your son's not going to graduate high school. He's going to have to go to summer school if he wants to graduate. He's not going to walk with his class. 
it, it was in that moment that I that I started to realize that I had tenacity. Not not because I wanted to be a better student, but because I wanted to prove people wrong. I wanted to prove them wrong. I didn't and I and I felt scared. I didn't want to not I didn't want to do summer school. I wanted to graduate with my class, right? So I somehow managed to dig in pass the test by the by the hair on my chinny chin chin and I end up getting C's, right? Or, or I end up getting A's in those last final scores of my schooling to pass with just enough, like a two point something, one. And everyone's like, we didn't think he was going to do it, but he did it. And I ended up graduating high school. So there's a story. Barely graduate middle school. Barely graduate high school. Now, I get a scholarship to go play basketball. Now, I had an offer to go to Caldwell University up in New Jersey. But I don't take it. I don't take it because I'm dating a girl at the time. And I don't want to leave my girlfriend. Don't want to go to a small Christian school up in the middle of nowhere. That doesn't excite me. I'm a city. I'm a city kid. And so I stay at home and I go to Broward College to play basketball, which ends up being the best thing that I could have done because I met one of my best friends, Joseph, at this, you know, college. And we were still friends, you know, almost 15 years later, 10 years later, whatever, whatever the amount of time. It seems like forever. And we, we do comedy together. And he's become my comedy, you know, journeyman, my comedy friend who, who has helped me along the way. So I go to the college and then I'm in the college and I start – to fail classes, and I end up failing out. I, I fail, and I can't play the second half of the season because my grades weren't good enough. And I thought the coach was going to protect me, but he didn't. So I ended up failing a bunch of classes after that. I go into a, a big state of depression. All my friends are playing college basketball at a, at a high level at big schools across the country on TV. They end up going to play professional overseas. A couple of them go play pro. And I'm hanging out with them. I'm feeling cool. I'm feeling like I'm important. I feel like I'm one of them because I'm getting to be around them. I'm still training, you know, at certain colleges. I go up there. I'd sleep on their couches for months because I didn't care about, you know, what my life was doing. I was just kind of riding their coattails thinking I was going to make it with them, be a part of their crew, a part of their posse. I'm hanging out down here in South Florida with one of the great Stan Remy who trains a ton of basketball players. I'm working out with him. You know, we're around Dwayne Wade, Udonis Haslam, Alonzo Mourning, down on um, Miami in the Overtown area. They had a gym over there. They used to have runs all the time, right right by the I-95 um, entrance at the beginning of Overtown. And uh, I realized that after failing a bunch of classes, my father says, this kid's going nowhere. He brings me to an Army recruiter's office of my brother. I test in the Army recruiter's test pass high. They told me you could do whatever you want. And I say, okay, well, I definitely don't want to go to the army. You know, I don't want to go to the army. Following orders is not for me. You know, the whole army thing scares the crap out of me. I'm like 20, 20 years old, 22 years old, whatever it was. I have a bad number with ages. And I remember that moment I had tenacity again. Tenacity, you know, started to flare up again. I said, I am not going to go to the army. I'm not. I'm not going to do this. I, I really am not. So my brother Shane shows me this video. And in this video, it is, it's very simple. This guy is in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in his house, in his library, library, and he goes, if you want to increase your life, don't try to take big leaps. What you need to do is you need to just increase by a very small percentage, like 1% every day. And his 1% he recommends is reading. He says, if you read every day, you will increase your ability to remember. You'll increase your ability to read faster. You'll increase your ability for critical thinking skills. And at that time, I had never read shit. The only way I passed my test I had reading was I looked at spark notes. Remember those spark notes? That's, that, was my, that was my way of getting by in school. And so I start to read in the morning time. And the first book I come across is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now, I know it's cheesy, but it, it is a good book. 
because the book talks about so many communication principles I would learn later on in life, but they give it to you in a very digestible way. And basically the theme of the book is called How to Win Friends and Influence People. What they should call it is how to use communication strategically to get what you want. Now, Gail, Dale Carnegie was a shoe, he was a salesman, I believe a shoe salesman. He ends up having a whole school, a Carnegie School of uh, Communication, I believe it is. It's not a college class, but it's like one of those independent, you know, they use it a lot in sales training and, you know, uh, companies do a lot of retreats where they go like Dale Carnegie uh, uh, retreats where they teach it at like a hotel lobby. I ended up almost working for the company after I graduated with my master's. And so I read this book and I, I start reading 15 minutes in the morning and then 15 minutes at night. And when I first start reading, I suck, right? I suck because the ability for my eyes to go left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right to read the lines your eyes get exhausted, right? Your eye has a muscle in the back in which it gets tired, right? Your eye gets tired from moving left to right, left to right, and you get this feeling where your eyes start to just, you know, drop down and begin to close. And I'm sure you've had that. I'm sure that you've had that feeling that when you read, you get sleepy. And, and that sleepiness is no different than if you try to run 10 miles and you've never run before at the one fourth mile marker, you're going to be exhausted and you're going to want to walk and you're going to walk and you're going to give up. And maybe you walk a mile, maybe you finish it. Maybe you get to a mile and a half and you probably quit. It's no different with reading. You try to read after a few minutes, your eyes get tired, you get tired and you need to stop. So I read for 15 minutes in the morning and I read for 15 minutes at night. Every day, I make a challenge. I said, I have tenacity. I'm going to do this. By the end of the month, I finished the book. I had never read a book front to cover ever in my life, ever. And I was able to finish the book. And it gave me confidence, right? I had completed something. No one had forced me. No school had forced me. No teacher had forced me. I had forced me. Tenacity had forced me. So the next month I said, okay, I'm going to increase by 1%. I'm going to read for 30 minutes first thing in the morning, and I'm going to read for 30 minutes right before I go to bed. I found two books that were on the similar vein of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. They were very much like self-help books, you know. I read those two books, and then boom. At the end of the month, I had read two books instead of one because I had increased an extra 15 minutes. I said, damn, I read three books. I read three books in, in one month or in two months. I've read three books in, 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 in two months. I've read three books. So then I go, okay. So then I go, I'm going to read for 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at lunch, 30 minutes in the evening. That month, I read four books. As it went along, I started to read longer. My 30-minute reading periods became 45-minute reading periods, and it became 45-minute reading periods four or five times a day. Whenever I was bored, I would just read the books that I had lying around. At this time, I was going to Palm Beach State College. I had failed so many classes that I was in academic probation, and my GPA was 1.788888. Everyone had given up hope. It was done. I, wasn't gonna, I, was, I was barely going to get my AA if I was lucky. But there was something that happened when I started reading that life became a little bit easier. I felt like as I read books, I was like Shao Kahn or Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat. I was like absorbing people's souls. Every time I read a book, I felt like I was absorbing someone's soul and I became addicted to that thirst. I became addicted to that thirst for knowledge because it made me smarter. It made me better at being a smart ass. It made me work harder at proving people wrong because I said, did you read the book? And I quickly learned that even though everyone was telling you to read, nobody was reading. So I realized that reading books and absorbing these people's souls, as I thought it would look, I was absorbed. <laughs> Within a year, I had read over 60 books. 
and psychology and self-help. That was basically it, psychology and self-help. I was really interested in, in human communication, but I didn't know it back then because I was trying to get my degree in biology, right? So I was taking these biology classes. I was taking uh, math classes, statistic classes, chemistry classes, because I was thinking I was going to become a physical therapist because that's what my father does. That's what my stepmother does. They're in the medical field, and they told me, get a job in medicine, you know, physical therapy. You could be active. It's good for your active body of ADHD, and as well, you get to be around athletes and sports. It's what you did before. It's what you'll do now, and you'll like it. I realized as I transferred after getting my AA to Florida Atlantic University, because when you go to a community college, you automatically get accepted into the college that was on the campus as well, because Palm Beach State College is on the same lot as Florida Atlantic University. So I get accepted. I'm in the biology program. I'm about 70% of the way in. I get to a lot harder classes, and I go, I hate this shit. I hate having to sit here and remember flashcards and note cards. I don't like this. I don't. <laughs> and so I go see a count, one of my academic counselors, advisors, or whatever, and I tell them this. And I say, I don't like this. I'm going to change my major. They say, well, you're, you're so far. You're so close to finishing. Why would you change? I say, I don't want it. I can't do it. I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I want to change. So we, we signed me up for some psychology courses. So I, I, I started taking some psychology classes at Florida Atlantic University, and I end up taking 12 credits worth. So I get a minor in it, and I go, I don't like this. I don't like this either. I don't, I don't want to hear people's problems all day like that doesn't sound like I already have a father who nags in my ear who constantly you know tells me that nothing is enough because that's the way he motivates tough love you know I, I listen to my friends complain you know I don't want to hear I don't want to have to do that for a living hear horrible stories no no offense to psychologists but it's not for me right everyone's got a thing that's not mine so we change again we change this time to sociology so I take sociology classes and I get 12 credits in sociology. I learn about, you know, uh, ethnography, the study of people um, and cultures. I love studying cultures. I love studying people, but it's just like from a scientific level, right? And I go, oh, it's too close to science. You know, this is, this is also boring for me as well. And someone recommends that I take this, you know, communication class. And so I take this communication class with uh, a professor who ends up becoming a professor that I end up really, really liking. And we, in the class, it's taught by him and it's taught by a new professor who, who came in. And it was a male, female, and they taught this class together. And their different perspectives were super interesting. They taught about rhetoric. And rhetoric is, you know, in a very simple term, the art of of persuasive speaking is one old definition of it, but there are, there are many definitions of rhetoric, but basically you can understand it as symbols and signs have certain meaning and rhetoric tries to understand what that meaning means to people. Symbols and signs, right? So a McDonald's logo is a sign, you know, has a meaning to people. You know, it's McDonald's. You don't see the M and go Mercedes. You know that those golden arches mean burgers. So it has this understanding. It's semiotics, we'll call it. And so I get super interested because communication studies is a mixture of psychology, sociology, biology, all squeezed into one lovely package. And it was in that moment that I got super excited about school. I got super excited about learning more. And when they assign things to read, because I had already been trained and I trained myself to read, I was going above and beyond. I wasn't just reading what they were assigning in class. I was going into the appendix. I was going into the references, and I was reading those references. I found myself speaking to them after class, arguing certain things that I had read, wondering why we hadn't talked about them in class. I said, well, you seem to be super interested in this. You should change your major to communications. Communication studies. So I do. I changed my major to communication studies and I love it. I thrive, 
right? Now, I'm still getting in trouble in class. Don't get that twisted. I cannot sit still. I cannot focus. And I cannot act the way that most people act. My body, my brain, it just does not function that way. I have to stand. I have to walk around. You know, I'm tapping on things on the desk. It's uh, Sitting still is something I cannot do. Even now, I'm rocking in my chair in my home office if you're not watching this on YouTube or watching the video. And so if you're out there and you're wondering yourself, okay, there's a lot of stories about, you know, trying something and then trying something new. Yes, that's tenacity, right? Tenacity would be your ability to overcome time and working your ass off. Timacity. And so I, I do really well in the program, even though I'm still getting in trouble. Professors necessarily don't like me because I'm 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 the worst student to have, but I'm I'm very good at reading now. And so I'm throwing in a lot of things into the conversation, into the pot, pissing people off because I have a different perspective on things, and I'm always trying to find the the untold story, which is where stand-up comedy comes in, finding that untold story. The, the hidden stories. And so I ended up graduating from FAU. Um, I think it's cum laude. No, not summa cum laude. It's the top cum laude with a 3.9 GPA, 3.889 GPA. And I'm thinking to myself, for the last couple of years, I have, you know, really taken advantage of my time at Florida Atlantic University, right? Not only was I becoming a student, but I started to look at the school because I was an older student. I was in my lower 20s, 23, 24. And I said, what is at the school for free that I could take advantage of that is free? Because if it's for free, then it's for me. And, and this goes to any college student or any non-college student if you're out there. Looking up free programs or things that are offered for free is always a great idea to start when you're broke. When you are broke, there are programs out there that are created for people who are broke like you. And there are free services. Now, was it completely free? No, because my college tuition was paying for it. So while I was in undergrad, in the last two years that I was there, I got super involved with media. I went to the local, my school radio station. I got involved. I started volunteering. I ended up getting my own radio show called Off the Beak. I learned how to work switchboards. I learned about the advertising that they had. No student had really asked those questions. And I was like, can we sell advertising for our show? They were like, well, no one's done it, but you can. So I learned how to create advertising packages. I contacted businesses, cold calling them. No one was forcing me to do this. I just, I was doing this because I wanted to. I was curious. I, I believe that I could see the matrix and I was going to define my world the way I wanted it to be defined. So I'm working at the radio station, have my own radio show. I'm volunteering at the school newspaper, writing articles periodically. I'm volunteering at the school TV station, trying to become a journalist or, you know, working on producing shows. I'm super involved in, the, in that aspect of it. And during that time, my friend is up in New York City, and he graduates from, Joseph, graduates from Brooklyn Film College. And during this time, we had remained in contact, and he starts doing stand-up comedy right up in New York. And I'm like, damn, I've always wanted to do stand-up too. So I decide I'm going to try to do stand-up comedy down here in South Florida because we had always, you know, been funny together on the phone. We had, you know, talked about passing jokes back and forth. So I signed up because South Florida is not a, you know, stand-up comedy community. I sign up during my undergrad while I'm reading books, while I'm going to school, I, I take these stand-up comedy classes offered at the improv. There's a hard rock improv at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood in which they offer stand-up comedy classes, stand-up 101. I take it with Will. I forgot his last name. One of the comedians ends up moving to New York. Hope you see this. You know, write a comment. I don't know. Share it with him. You know who it is. Will teaches the class, eight-week class. You write jokes, right? And then you go into it, and you finally perform your jokes in the last eight weeks. I do decent. I do okay. I hated the class. I thought it was stupid. 
Okay, a lot of people in there are just doing it for a hobby. They don't actually want to become comedians. So I take stand-up comedy, the second one, 201 or 202, whatever they want to call it. Pretty much the same thing. Stupid. I take the class, seven weeks of education, eighth week is a performance. On my eighth week performance, eh, I do okay, right? At the time, there was only really one open mic that was in the area. Social media wasn't around that much back then. It was hard to find shows. And so there was this place called the Funky Buddha, which was a brewery which offered open mics on Wednesdays. And so I start doing the open mic on Wednesdays, and I realize I hate this. I hate waiting in line. I hate having to sit there for hours just to perform five minutes. My five minutes wasn't that strong. You know, I didn't feel comfortable or confident on stage. I'd never really taken a public speaking class. Uh, I'd never really, you know, been trained. I never really had any guidance. All I had was Joseph, who we'd write jokes with together, and I was out there by myself. I had no friend in Miami or South Florida or Broward or Palm Beach that was a stand-up comedian that was doing this journey with me. I was by myself. So finally, I do an open mic at the Hard Rock. It's open mic night, not a class. And I had taken stand-up comedy 101, stand-up comedy 201, and I had taken emceeing 101, right, Um, to learn how to produce shows for myself. I go up there. I do a terrible job. I have jokes about Lady Gaga and a meat suit. My brother records it on this old VHS, uh, this camera with the tapes in it. Wish I could find that tape. I get off stage. I go, I'm never doing this again. I hated this. I bombed. I didn't like, I didn't get laughs. I was like, you know what? (laughs) Screw this. I don't want to do this. Thankfully, the girl I was dating at the time motivated me to go, you know what? Don't quit quite yet. So again, sometimes when you can't have tenacity, somebody can have tenacity for you. And you got to be open enough to listen to that person with tenacity to go, okay, you're trying to let me know that I should keep going. She tells me, go to the school where we're at school. Let's go to a basketball game. We go to a basketball game on campus. And there's a guy there, and he's hosting the games. And she goes, why don't you do that for the university? Why don't you do that? Because that's you can be funny, perform, but not expected to be funny like a stand-up comic. All right. That seems like something that's possible to do. I reach out to the school. After that game, I go down to the court and I say, hey, I would love to really become an arena host. How does that happen? Oh, we're not looking for anybody right now. There's no job available. Um, Take my email and contact us and we'll let you know if something comes up. Well, lo and behold, they did not know who they were dealing with. They were dealing with Mr. Tenacity. And so I contact the school. I email them the next day. I say, hey, Aaron, just met yesterday. Would love to work for the, the Department of Athletics doing hosting for the games. Is there any opportunities? No opportunity there. No, thank you, but no. Thank you, but big N-O. Do I take that no and just say, well, I tried? Of course not. I contacted them every two weeks for four months. I showed up to other sporting events, baseball games, volleyball games, softball games, Asking them, can I host this? Can I host this? Can I host this? Can I host this? No, 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 no. So finally, one day comes and the kid who was hosting the games goes on a spring break fraternity trip. And he's not able to host the games. So they call me. They say, hey, Aaron, you've been contacting us so much, blah, blah. We have an opportunity. We have a spring break basketball tournament for men and women. It's like six games. Would you be able to host all six games? Of course, I realize you can't be too available. I said, let me check my calendar. Let me see if I could pencil you in. So I call them back. I say, hey, check my calendar. I'm available. They say, great, blah, blah. Make sure you come to the game, blah, blah. You'll be fine. So I show up to the game. The day of, I go into this basketball arena. There's about 2,000 fans. And I am shitting my pants. They, they tell me what I'm supposed to do. I have these cue cards where I'm supposed to read advertisements, make them fun, make them exciting, and do some fan engagement. I remember showing up. I was holding the paper. It was shaking like a leaf. I was shaking like a leaf. But I got through it. I figured it out. I messed up a little bit. I ad-libbed, but I rolled with it, and I did it. It was terrifying, but I did it. At the end of the game, one of the advertisers came up to me, and they said, man, we loved what you did. You were funny. You were charismatic. 
we could understand what you were saying. We'd love to, you know, keep you around. I said, don't tell me. I appreciate the comment, but go tell the director. Go tell them. They're the one that makes the decision. He leaves. I said, man, maybe I got something to go. I go home that night. I start using my little noodle. I've been reading a lot. I was, you know, trying to be more business-minded. I'd always been business-minded as a kid. I sold dice in middle school. You know, I sold T-shirts with, like, the spray paint on them with the characters, and that was cool, like the Looney Tunes characters. Uh, I mowed lawns. I was, I was, I collected quarters by the vending machine. You know, I was always interested in finding a way to get money. So I go home that night and I go on sunbiz.org and I buy a business license. And it costs me $225. I get a business license because I feel like when they call me, I don't want them to offer me an internship. I want them to pay me, make them think that I'm a business. So the they call me the next day and they say, hey, Aaron, we'd love you to come in and we'd love to talk to you about, you know, the future games. We had a game tonight, but we'd love to talk to you about the future of moving forward. I say, sure. I come in. I tell them I have a business. I have a company. I printed out my business license certificate. I say I host events all the time. Lies. Hire me. They say, wow, we never, you know, we never didn't, we didn't know that you were, you know, professional at this. I said, I'm very professional. Um. They said, okay, we can start you off at dollars a game. I said, five. They said, okay, five dollars a game. And we have about 10 games left in the season, and then we'll see where it goes. So that's it. Uh, that was the first time I started a company as a host. And so they hire me for those six games. They keep me for the rest of the season. They love me. They pay me. And I started a business, and I started making money hosting. Never done it before. Tenacity. The season ends, and they have football season. They just build a big stadium, 32,000-person stadium at FAU. They contact me and say, would you want to be a, a co-host to the wonderful Andrea Ocampo, who had been the arena host before I was there. She was also the arena host for the Florida Panthers. She had a lot of on-camera experience. I said, yeah, absolutely. There's a game. I said, okay, dollars a game. I shouldn't be talking about money. That's what my dad told me. Pay me a certain amount of money during the game. And so Andrea ends up becoming a mentor to me. Now, is she an active mentor? No. You know, she is not purposely going out of her way to mentor me, but by being around her, I learned a lot of the skills and opportunities. I absorbed them. I was absorbing and learning and absorbing and learning and absorbing and learning. So Andrea taught me a lot about being a professional, dealing with fans, being on camera, wearing makeup. I used to wear makeup back then. But she was a woman, and I needed to find a male mentor. So I go on to the internet, and I find that the Miami Heat have a male arena host, Dale McLean. So social media wasn't that big, but I had Instagram back then. So I contact Dale through Instagram. He doesn't answer. And I see that on his Instagram after a couple of weeks, he's going to be in Boca Raton where I lived at this jazz club. And I said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to meet him. And I'm going to put myself in a place where I could talk to him face to face and ask him some questions that I need to know about this industry. Because I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. I was still writing jokes at the time with Joseph, still writing scripts, still writing comedy, but I wasn't doing stand-up anymore. But I was helping Joseph, who was doing stand-up, and he was growing fast in the stand-up community in New York City. So I show up to this event. I sit outside for 10 minutes, scared. I finally go in. I watch him perform. Unbelievable, fantastic, charismatic, funny, entertaining. Dale is truly a master at what he does. At the end of the event, I wait around, I wait around, I wait around, I wait around. Finally, he's alone. I run up to him and I go, hey, Dale, my name is Aaron. I'm the arena host at FAU. I, I, there's no male mentorships available for this industry. You're a man in this industry. Can I, can I learn stuff from you? Can I get your phone number? Very nice, very kind. Gives me his number. He says, call me sometime. And that was it. Lo and behold, he didn't realize how much I was going to call him. I was texting him, calling him, hey, 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 hey. Finally, he says, Meet me at the American Airlines Arena. I'll let you shadow me for a Miami Heat basketball game. Okay, we're going somewhere. I go down and I shadow him for the game. And again, I absorb. He doesn't directly mentor me. But by being around him, seeing his professionalism, seeing how he interacts with fans, seeing how he works with camera with the IFB, setting up his shots. He tells me how he sets up his shots. I'm asking questions. He's answering them. He's super kind. I learn a lot. I shadow him at the Miami Heat. And I learn a ton from Dale. 
I bring that experience back to FAU. Andrea leaves to become a full-time Panthers arena host and working with the Panthers Latin media market. I become the full-time Panther or, or arena host for FAU. And I start writing scripts called Aaron on the Street, which they show in, in the games on the Jumbotron in front of ten to 15,000 fans, sometimes 20,000 fans at the games. Um, one game, we have the historic game versus University of Miami. I'm hosting in front of 32,000 fans, the most people I've ever been in front of in my entire life. And I'm writing these scripts for FAU. I assemble a team. I put out flyers on campus. I find students who are interested in the athletic program. I have a little crew. We meet at Starbucks. We write the scripts. I produce them with Ryan Moran, who was the athletic department um, videographer at the time and worked in marketing. He was wonderful. He helped me with all these videos and co-producing them with me. Um, I produce the scripts. I write the scripts. I, I'm, I'm a talent in the scripts. I'm doing this all DYI. Andrew, who's there from Riff Films, he's helping me. He's an intern there. We, we, we produce all these creative scripts that are awesome and available to everybody, and they're showing them inside the stadium. They do a news, they do a survey to fans. They find out that Aaron on the Street is one of the top, the top thing that fans find the most entertaining about the football games. Gives me a lot of confidence. After I graduate from FAU with my bachelor's, and I'm the arena host. I work at the TV station, the radio station. A professor of mine contacts me and says, hey, we want you to go and we want you to start and be a part of the graduate program. <laughs> You're crazy. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to go to do more school. I'm moving to New York with Joseph, and we're going to do stand-up comedy. That's what I'm doing. She's like, we think would you be great for the program, and this professor, Dr. Awaitsawe, becomes a huge mentor of mine and the reason why I am where I am today. She believes in me. She's a kind woman. She's smart, intelligent. She sees something in me I don't see. Again, someone sees the tenacity in me and just wants to bring it out. Tells me to apply for the program. I apply for the program, and I end up getting it. I end up getting the program, and I end up getting a teaching assistant, graduate teaching assistant, which means that I will be teaching classes while getting my master's degree. So I went from being a failing student to becoming a professor in training, getting my master's degree for free from Florida Atlantic University. If you're out there and you think to yourself, things aren't possible, they are possible. They're, they're difficult, but possible. So here I am, graduating in August, like third or fourth, starting a program like August 10th or 15th, going from being an undergraduate to teaching undergraduates, public speaking, intro to film studies, interpersonal communication. It's just, I couldn't believe it. So now at this point, I'm the arena host of Florida Atlantic University, hosting all the athletic events on campus. I have a radio show called Off the Beak that I'm doing. I'm with the newspaper. I'm with the TV station. I start hosting concerts with Red Man, Method Man, Waka Flocka Flame. Uh, I'm hosting their events at the bonfire. I'm writing scripts that are getting shown on the Jumbotron in the middle of football games. I am now offered, here's opportunity to say, we're looking for the Graduate College of Arts and Letters is looking for someone to become the representative of the College of Arts and Letters. Again, Aaron applies for it. Aaron goes, I, I want that. No one seeks it out but me. I'm the only one. Tenacity. So I become the president of the Graduate College of Arts and Letters. I become one of the representatives for the entire college for the Graduate School of Communication as well as the Graduate School of Florida Lang University in general. I'm sitting in the meeting with deans, the presidents, the vice presidents, all while getting my master's degree, all while teaching classes, all while hosting these events on campus, all while having a radio show. It, there was times where I didn't think I was able to, like, I didn't even know how I slept. I didn't sleep. I'm not much of a sleeper. Just tenacity. 
I graduate from FAU and with my master's degree, I'm thinking again, I'm off to New York City. I'm out of here. Nope. Saturday, I get a call. Hello, ring, ring, ring. Hello, 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 hello. hello. Hi, this is Miami Dade College. We got a recommendation from someone, and they we think that you'd be a great fit to be a full time professor at uh at our college. A what? A full time professor? We're offering you a full time professor job, uh, starting uh salary at fifty k and uh, benefits, and uh, health insurance and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. L- look, uh, I didn't even apply for the job. We know, but we 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 heard about you. You know, you have, you have a great presence in the community. Um, and someone had highly recommended you saying you'd be a great and wonderful teacher. We want to know if you want the job. I said, okay, well, when do I have to decide? Right now. <laughs> right what? Right now. That's right. I'm offered a job on a Saturday afternoon, and I have to decide if I want the job right then and there. I said, can I have 24 hours to make a decision? She says, you have less. Call me Sunday morning, 12 hours away. Tell me if you want the job or not. You start Monday. So I call my dad. I say, Dad, I got this job offer to become a professor at Miami Dade College full-time, benefits and all this stuff. Before I even finish this, you take the bird in the hand, not the bird in the bush. The what? I don't have a bird. You take the bird in the hand, not the bird in the bush. What does that mean? That means you take the opportunity that's right in front of you instead of the opportunity that's hypothetical. Okay, I get it. He wanted me to take the job, the secure job. And he always does. And in entertainment, there's no secure job, ever. Your job is never secure in entertainment unless you get a wonderful, wonderful contract. But that is far likely to not happen until later in your career or if you're very lucky very early and you have good people around you, you have a lot of talent. So I don't take the job. I mean, I take the job. I don't go to New York to do stand-up comedy and move in with Joseph up in New York. I stay here and I become a full-time professor at Miami Dade College. Literally, a few days later, I had been sniffing out the Florida Panthers job over the last few months because Andreo Campo was rumored to be leaving to go to a bigger opportunity with the World Wrestling Entertainment Association, WWE. And I'm sniffing out that opportunity. Like a truffle pig. I want that job as the arena host. That's the biggest, that's the biggest you can go as an arena host. Working for a professional sports team. So I've been reaching out to them in every way possible. LinkedIn to different people, looking up who's a director, writing them emails, contacting them, calling them. I'm getting no responses. Finally, I get a call saying, hey, Aaron, we've been getting your emails. We'd love you to come for a tryout. Tryout? I got this in the bag. This is mine. You're giving me a tryout? I got it. I show up that day. The other people trying out are awful. One guy is wearing khaki pants, boat shoes, dress shirt, tie, no jacket. The other guy, I don't remember. He was wearing, he was so insignificant, I don't remember what he was wearing or who he was. I just remember that one guy with the boat shoes and the khakis. And what I had learned from Dale McLean, the arena host from the Miami Heat, was to always dress to impress. So I showed up in a fly jacket, dress shirt, You know, nice ripped jeans, sneakers, hair done, earrings. Bam, I'm looking fresh. I'm feeling fresh. I said, I got this in the bag. We do it. The other guy had no training as an arena host. I'd already been at FAU. You know, I've been doing this now three, four, five seasons. I crush it. I get the job. So now I am graduated with my master's degree. I have... Been a professor for the last two years as a graduate teaching assistant. The arena host of the university have a very successful show called Aaron on the Street that it gets shown in the stadiums on the Jumbotron. I'm writing commercials for the university. I'm hosting concerts for the university. I have a radio show still. I'm working for the TV station. I'm working for the newspaper station. I'm the graduate. I'm the president of the Graduate College of Arts and Letters. I I was doing it all. I was doing everything I could. 
So now all this time goes by and I never have a podcast. I never have a podcast. I don't do well on social media. I don't want to do well on social media because the college professor in me, the media studies professor in me, it is difficult to participate in social media when you know it's being weaponized as a way to keep people mindless. And it's difficult to produce media for me knowing that I want people to get off their phones and I want them to become media literate. I want them to become critical of the media they're absorbing. I want them to ask who's the author, what's their agenda. And when you start a show, you got to say things like turn on your push notifications. I don't want people to have their push notifications on. I want you to get off the damn phone. I don't want you to check out my photos that are silly. I want you to read a book. I don't want you to watch my YouTube videos. I want you to go out into the community and be a community activist and actually do things to change the world. So I always struggle. So even though I had all these things like a radio show, I'm the arena host of a professional sports team for the NHL Florida Panthers. I end up becoming the arena host for Major League Lacrosse. They have a team, an expansion team called the Florida Launch. I host the national championship for Major League Lacrosse. Charlotte, North Carolina, or South Carolina. I'm doing all these things in the media, and I'm not promoting myself at all. Because I don't, I feel guilty. I feel this di- this, this problem, this dichotomy. I, I don't want you to watch me on social media because I want you to watch no one on social media. I want you to read books. I want you to be critical of the media you're ingesting. I want you to know who is producing the media. What is Instagram, Facebook's agenda? Are they actually helping you? Social media can be the junk food of the internet. And I want you off of it. And I didn't know how to make content that was worthy of sharing that actually informed you instead of just entertained you. And I still struggle with it. So here we are. Why am I making this podcast? I'm making this podcast because everything was taken away from me. Over the last year, I had quit being a full-time professor at Miami Dade College and I was doing entertainment full-time. I've been an entertainer for the last eight years. I think it's the ninth year, maybe going on to nine. And I found myself saying, wow, even though I am the best, I believe I am the best live entertainment host, I am a comedian, I'm a professor, I'm a producer, I'm a writer, I'm a community activist, I believe that I was the best at my job. I was the host for Bang Energy, traveling all around the country with Bang Energy, hosting their events. I was the arena host for the Florida Panthers. I was working with Major League Lacrosse as the arena host for Florida Launch, and I hosted the national championship. I performed at the Miami Improv as a stand-up comedian within the last year. I had passed an audition at the Hard Rock Comedy Club, opening up for Harlan Williams and Carlos Mancia in February. I had performed stand-up comedy in seven states across the country. I was going to host the Arthritis Foundation charity gala up in Detroit, Michigan in April. I was supposed to do a comedy tour that same trip with Heron Entertainment. Comedy producer who put it on comedy shows in all 50 states across this country. Everything was going for me. I was having the best, most successful moment of my career. And then this happened. COVID. All that taken away. Comedy tour taken away. Comedy clubs taken away. Entertainment taken away. I was working at the Cleveland or in South Beach. All of it gone. Taken away. Just like that. Thousands of dollars, tons of opportunities, about to do my first stand-up comedy tour, all gone. 
And at first I found myself depressed and upset and angry and confused. I still find myself depressed, upset, angry, and confused. But I started this podcast because I wanted to find a way to make my entertainment career as a stand-up comedian and my college professorness as a stand-up, as a, as a college professor, come together into one. I am Aaron the Speaker, comedian and educator. And I'm trying to do more, and I'm hoping that this podcast can do more for you and for me to become more of a community activist, get my ideas out there, show people the tenacity that I have and the tenacity that you can have and the tenacity that we all need to have, especially during these times which are extremely difficult. I wanted to keep this podcast episode around an hour, and I have. The future episode I have is going to be with Jenea, a professor who has studied with me at Florida Atlantic University, and we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, and we're going to talk about all the things that are going on right now with identity and blackness and the protests. And after that, I'm going to start interviewing a whole bunch of people because that's the only way I can entertain right now to feel safe during this COVID-19, and, and I really want to find a way to free myself of this burden of not doing media and not producing my own media. And I'm sure this first, I'm going to look back at this first episode and be like, this was crap. Because when you first try something, it's always crap. And I don't expect this podcast to take off right away, and I don't expect it to be successful because it's not about that. It's about just doing it to do it. And if I'm doing it within 10 years, it will become better. And I want to send that message to you as well. Whatever you're doing in your life, whatever you have going on, you're never going to be good at it right in the beginning. Just have the tenacity to push through. And yes, sometimes you're not going to push through. And I've, I've gone years now without doing a podcast, even though I've said I was going to. I've gone years now without producing my own media. I was the arena host of the NHL Florida Panthers, and I never posted about it because I thought it was more important to be good at my job in person and connect with fans than it was for me to be on social media. Let me say it again. When I go to events, I found it more important to connect with people and fans in real life, in real time, shake their hands, touch them, feel them, be with them in the moment, to be the best entertainer I can be live and not worry about my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Because it was more important for me to always connect with a human being than it was their digital sim character. But I'm trying to change that now. I'm trying to do both. And if you like this episode, send me some encouragement. Let me know what you thought about it. They're going to get better. It's going to improve. I appreciate you being on this journey with me. And all I got to say is, I'm Aaron the Speaker. Comedian educator and I'm trying to figure it out just like you are until the next episode guys I love you I'm with you and we'll see where this journey takes us